Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Before we go any further, if you're physically able to, why don't you just lift your hands up toward the, toward the heavens. Lift up your head and look to where your help comes from. Your help comes from the Lord. Begin to call upon His name. Hallelujah. Ha. Glory to God. Glory to God. Lord Jesus, we welcome you here. We invite you into this place. Speak to us, O oh Lord, today. Let the very presence of God be felt in this place, moving and stirring and touching our hearts. We need you, Lord, more than we need anything and more than we need everything. Have your way of it now. Have your way even right now. Ah, yes. Don't stop, church. Don't stop, church, for just a moment longer. Go ahead. Reach up with your voice. Reach up with your faith. Reach up and give him glory. Reach up and meet his presence. We love you, Lord. We honor you, Lord. We exalt you, Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, yes. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Close my eyes and it sounds like heaven. John, in the book of Revelation, said, I heard the voice of many waters. Amen. When you all begin to lift up your voice and worship the Lord, it sounds like the sound of many waters. Sounds like heaven to me. It makes me long for my home. That place I've never been before, but that I still call home. It's where my Savior is. It's in the presence of the Lord. It's in the company of the angels and the patriarchs of faith. Ah, I'm looking forward to heaven. I said I'm looking forward to going to heaven. Does anybody feel like I feel? Yes, even so, Lord, come quickly. Even so, Lord, come quickly. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. But in the meantime, our Lord said we are to occupy until he comes. And so we are here to do that very thing. Exodus chapter 14. Turn your attention in your Bibles to the book of Exodus chapter 14. We'll begin our reading with verse 1 and read down through verse 4. I will also be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So we are going to be looking at Exodus chapter 14 and then 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Good to see, amen, so many of our church family gathered here today in this place, amen, along with some unfamiliar faces. Why don't we give it up for our guests that are here today. Let them know how glad we are to have them with us worshiping our King. Praise God, praise God. I don't know if you noticed as you were walking into the south lobby, you may have noticed just straight ahead there was a black box. And that black box is our baptistry, and it is filled up. It is ready to go. Praise God. And Lord willing, we will be doing some baptisms here very soon. Exodus chapter 14, verse 1. Exodus chapter 14, verse 1, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they, everybody say turn, that they turn and encamp before Pi-ha-hi-roth. That's how you say it, <laughs> real slowly. Between Migdal, that one's a little easier, and the sea over against baal Zephon. Before it shall ye encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, 
when he hears about where they are at, where they have turned towards, where they are positioned at, when he hears about where the children of Israel are at, he will say this, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And the Lord said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host. Why? So that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Somebody say amen. I feel led of the Lord to preach on this subject, God's turn. God's turn. Let us pray and ask the Lord to speak to us from these scriptures. Amen. I will direct your attention when we get started to 1 Corinthians 10. But before we do, I want us to pray together and ask the Lord to speak to us very clearly from his word. And that I will follow after the Spirit and I will speak his word. Father, we love you and we thank you so much for this day. I thank you for the opportunity we have to gather in this place. Lord, to worship you, to sing, to fellowship, and to hear your word. I'm asking that your spirit that dwells in me will lead and guide me to speak your word and not my own. And that we all will sit and be hearers of the word and not hearers only but also doers. I pray, Lord, that we will hear and receive the word and quickly apply it in our lives. However you lead us, Lord, I thank you. I believe, Lord, that the church is going to be strengthened today. I believe that souls are going to be saved. I believe that people will be born again. I believe that the church will grow with the increase of God. We give you all the thanks and the praise. And everybody say in Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. The Lord told Moses to tell his people to turn. And he positioned them exactly where he wanted them and in such a place that it would cause Pharaoh to believe that they were stuck, that they were entangled in the land, the wilderness had shut them in, and that he would pursue them for the purpose so that the Egyptians may know that the Lord, he is God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, the Bible says, moreover, brethren, someone say, that's me. That's right, that's, that's you. We're the brethren. If you don't feel comfortable with that, you would rather sistren. <laughs> so be it. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians in that first letter, chapter 10, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant. Sounds like a good pastor, right? He doesn't want his folks to be ignorant. <laughs> I don't want you to be ignorant either. And so he explains to them something. He said, all of our fathers, all of those that came before us, and he's speaking specifically about a certain era, a certain generation, a certain group of their fathers. He is speaking of the group of people that we just read about in Exodus. He says they were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And they were all baptized. Someone say baptized. They were all baptized with the baptism of Moses. And the baptism of Moses was in the cloud and in the sea. And they did all also eat that same spiritual meat, and they did all drink that same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. It was Christ. Verse 11, this is key now in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 11, it says, Now all these things happened unto them for examples for us. For they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And does anybody else feel like you are a part of that generation upon 
whom the ends of the world have come. I feel like I'm a part of that last generation, that I am living in what we call the last days. I find it interesting, and my wife has spoken about this before, I find it interesting that when they went to name this upcoming generation, they named it Generation Z, which happens to be the last letter in the alphabet, in case you missed that class in elementary school. The last generation. Now let me back up and give you a little bit of history, the history of Israel. We see that long before Joseph was even born to his father Israel, this child whom Israel, who was also known as Jacob, he loved. Loved so much that he gave him a coat of, of many colors. And his love for his son Joseph was obvious to the extent that it made his siblings quite jealous. To the point that they wanted to kill Joseph, but they settled for selling him into bondage. And Joseph was taken into Egypt, and many of you know the story, Joseph as a 17-year-old boy was taken and stripped from his family and taken into Egypt, and he was put into slavery as a servant to a man named Potiphar. Potiphar's wife would lie on him that would result in him being put into prison. And while in prison, he would rise above the rest where even the guards would honor him and place him responsible over other prisoners. And during that time, he would tell and interpret the dreams of a butler and a baker. And the one request that he had to these men, or at least to one of the men, the, the butler, as he said, remember me when you rise back to your position there with Pharaoh, remember me. But yet we find him being forgotten for two more years from then before finally this butler, when he would hear of Pharaoh, his boss's dream that he wanted interpreted so badly, finally it dawned on him he had forgotten that favor he was supposed to give to his prison buddy, Joseph. Joseph was called in before Pharaoh. Joseph interpreted the dream. This caused Joseph to rise to the second most powerful position in all of Egypt, which was the superpower of the civilized world at that time. And Joseph, he would see from his chair of authority his brothers come in and beg for food kneeling before him just like he had dreamt about when he was 17 years old just like God had given to him in a dream of course when God gave him the dream he didn't give him the process by which that would be fulfilled and how Joseph would arrive to that place of authority to which he would see his brothers come and bow before him we find that Joseph would make provision not only for his brothers, but for their wives and for their families and for his father. And he would relocate all of his family to come and dwell in the land of Egypt, particularly in the land of Goshen. There were 70 souls that would come that consisted of the entire family that belonged under this man named Israel or Jacob. And this family would grow and become large and multiply within the boundaries or the borders of Egypt. And there arose a king long after Joseph had died, there would arise a king in Egypt that would recognize that these Israelites were multiplying and becoming so great in number that he feared that if an enemy would rise against Egypt, that if the Israelites would partner together with his enemies, that surely he would be overtaken. So he began to make the Israelites very subtly, very wisely. No doubt it happened slowly, little by little over the course of time that these Israelites who were just residents in Egypt became servants and slaves to Pharaoh. Over the course of many years now, the tables were to such an extent where Pharaoh would rule and he would put taskmasters over the Israelites who were great in number and cause them to serve in hard labor for almost nothing at all. Some Bible scholars estimate that the number of Israelites at the time that Israel came out of Egypt could have been as great as two million. 
Two million. I don't know how many Egyptians there were, but if you had two million people living within your borders, you might realize that they were a force to be reckoned with. To such an extent that what Pharaoh wanted to do was to kill all of the baby boys that were born to try to force them to intermarry with the Egyptians so that the Israelite women would have to marry Egyptian men until that bloodline was almost completely dissolved away. And from this dark time, this Holocaust-like, this, this time of so many abortions happening, that's what it really was, these babies being aborted, we find that there was this one child that was preserved. His name was Moses. That was the name that Pharaoh's daughter gave him when she found him in the banks of the river. And she drew him out. Moses meaning drawn out. And Moses would be raised in Pharaoh's palace and educated in Egypt, Egyptian schools. But that at the age of a, perhaps this, this accountability, this age where he recognized that the Egyptians are not my brothers, but my brothers, my family, my blood are these Israelites. And, and one day he saw his brothers being badly abused and he tried to intervene and he even killed an Egyptian. And he hid the, the body of the Egyptian in the sand. And the next day when he saw his brothers, two Israelite men, in a quarrel, in a heated argument, he tried to be this judge between them. And they looked at him asking, who are you? No doubt they had a little bit of a, uh, a, 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 a hatred, a resentment against Joseph. Why? Because perhaps they knew, yeah, you might be one of us, but you weren't raised in the same house as we were. You were raised with a golden spoon in your mouth. And they refused to listen to him and even exploited him and said, are you going to try to kill one of us like you killed the Egyptian? And, and, and here Moses knew that his act was, it was broadcasted. People knew about it. And he ran for his life. At 40 years old, up to 40 years old, he grew up there in Egypt's borders. But at 40 years old, he ran for his life to the backside of the wilderness. And he, he linked himself together with a man and he married his daughter and he became a, a shepherd, a meager shepherd, and he eked out a, a living there on the backside of the wilderness. And it was there. After 40 long years, God had been listening to the cry of his people, Israel, who were in Egypt, who were 40 more years in slavery. They were crying crying out for a deliverer. They were crying out for a Savior. And as a response, God would handpick Moses and he would come to him by way of a burning bush that was burning but yet not consumed. And he would call out to Moses and tell him to remove his sandals for the ground that he was standing on was holy ground. And he would reveal himself to Moses. He would bring revelation of who he was and his name. When he would ask of his name, God would tell Moses, I am who I will be. I am that I am. And he said, go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses, with great hesitation and all sorts of excuses, was finally strong-armed by God. And he was coupled together with his brother Aaron, who would be his spokesperson. And he returned to Egypt. This is a beautiful story of redemption. This is a beautiful story of how God delivered the Israelite people out of slavery under Egyptian rule. And, and, and Exodus, the book of Exodus, especially the first half of Exodus, is probably one of my favorite portions of the Bible, filled with excitement and wonder and filled with characters that you and I no doubt could relate with. Moses, this imperfect person, now 80 years old, wanders back into Egypt and he stands in Pharaoh's court and he tells Pharaoh, let the Israelites go. You know the story, I'm sure. He refuses to let the, the Israelites go and his heart becomes hardened and God performs many mighty signs and wonders. He causes all of the water to be turned into blood. He causes frogs to come out of the river Euphrates and fill their houses, even fill their ovens. And then he causes the dust of the land, the dirt of the land to become as lice and lice filled the land of Egypt. He caused swarms of flies to be so thick to fill the houses listen I don't know about you but I can't stand if one flies in my house is that right Jonathan 
we got fly wars. I mean, just yesterday, my son, I said, there's a fly in the bathroom. Go get him. He goes in there with two fly swatters. Comes out, he says, I got him. But this plague, no doubt, was supernatural. It was extraordinary. These flies so thick that came upon Egypt. And then the fifth plague was the Egyptian livestock died. All of their livestock, all of their cows died. And the sixth plague was the boils both on the Egyptian people and on the animals. They broke out in terrible, oozing, pussing boils. Just picture it for a moment. <laughs> kind of gross. The seventh plague came, the storm of hail that was mixed with fire. And then the eighth plague, the plague of locusts that devoured anything that was left green after the previous seven plagues. And then the ninth plague is probably one of the ones that I'm most curious about. It's the plague of darkness. And all of these nine plagues, God, He draws a line. He knows exactly where the Egyptian, uh, Egyptians live and exactly where the Israelites live. And He causes all nine of these plagues to come upon the Egyptians and not touch the Israelites. He knew which cow belonged to the Egyptians, which cow belonged to the Israelites. And these plagues came upon Egypt and the ninth plague, this one that I'm so curious about, was a plague of darkness, darkness that was so thick, the Bible says it could be felt. And nobody moved. Nobody moved for three days. But then the tenth plague this infamous plague, this plague that would institute a, a celebration that would be remembered every generation since then and is still celebrated to this very day. After some 4,000 years, people still celebrate what had happened in that 10th plague to this very day. And that was when God would bring death to all of the firstborn of both man and beast. And he instructed Moses to tell the Israelites, listen, if you want to avoid this, I am not going to, I'm not going to differentiate between the Israelites and the Egyptians on this one. It's up to you. You have got to put the blood on your house. You have got to kill. You've got to find a perfect lamb and kill it at your door and take the blood and apply it to the doorpost and to the lintel because when I come through every house that does not have the blood applied there will be death in that house nobody will be except exempted except those who have the blood of the lamb now listen carefully the hold of Egypt that had that it had on these Israelites for the previous 430 years it required it seems 10 powerful plagues, supernatural plagues by God. With a mighty hand, God said, I will deliver my people out of Egypt. And in order for that hold of Egypt that it had on Israel to be broken free, these ten supernatural plagues came forth. Powerful miracles that came against Egypt that would result in Pharaoh not just telling them they could go, but the Bible records that Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, literally kicked them out of the door. He cast them out. He threw them out. He didn't care. He didn't care that Israel had borrowed all sorts of gold and silver and jewels from the Egyptians. He didn't care that their caravan was going to be loaded down with Egypt's gold. He didn't care at that point. He threw them out just as fast as he could. He was so sick and so tired of them. So that 430 year, this death hold that Egypt had on Israel was finally broken loose. It was broken loose. They had broken free. And every plague, it demonstrated the superiority of the God of Israel over every God of the Egyptians. And it crushed Egypt's hardened heart. And it taught Israel powerful lessons. Stay with me now. Because once they exit out of Egypt, the Bible says that there was a supernatural appearance that came to them. During the day, there was this cloud, a pillar of cloud that appeared to them that would lead them. They would literally follow a cloud. And at night, that cloud would turn into a form of fire that lit up the sky. You talk about a nightlight. 
God would appear to them, the angel of the Lord would appear to them as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, and he would lead them out of Egypt to wherever he wanted them to go. The Israelites came marching out of Egypt. But listen, the exodus was not yet complete. Even though they had broken free from that hold that Egypt had on them, that chain of bondage that was around their feet and hands, that, that tie to that bondage, that slavery, that past Egypt, it was broken free. But their exodus was not yet complete. They were led purposely by divine design to the sea with mountains on either side of them. And they realized at that point that Egypt was coming up behind them. They were trapped. There was no way out. Someone say God's turn. God had directed them exactly where he wanted them. It seemed to them now that their current position was worse than their prior. It was worse where they were than where they were before. God led them to their impossible situation. Sometimes things will seem to get worse before they get better. I know it might be a little cliche, but it's true. The night is darkest just before the dawn. That moment, and you really can't tell where it is or when it happens, but there is a moment where the night seems impossibly dark and it won't end. But look toward that eastern horizon. It may not be the full strength of the sun, but there is a glimmer of daylight that seems to be arising. You can't really find the line of where the darkness stops and the light begins, but I'm telling you that I know the night is coming to an end. Deliverance was available. The lamb had been slain. The spoils of Egypt were in hand, but for the exodus to be complete, they had to be born through. They had to be led through the womb of the cloud and the sea so that they could emerge from on the other side of these two elements that God would intentionally and powerfully use in their present for our example. While the works rendered and the lamb slain was effective in jarring the loose that Egypt had on Israel, Egypt's army was still intact and in full force and effect. And Pharaoh was alive and now he was filled with rage. His firstborn had died. The firstborn of his commander had died. The firstborn of his captains had died. You want to talk about angry? These men were filled with rage and all they had on their mind was revenge. Israel may have had Egypt's gold and they may have been out of their houses of bondage and they may have been just on the edge of Egypt's borders but something had to still happen so that they might know so that Egypt might know that the Lord, He is God. Oh, praise God. You see, our transformation, it happens on the other side of the sea. Oh, praise God. You see, where they stopped at on the other side of the sea was the mountain of God. The mountain of God is where they got the tables of stone that were written with the finger of God, the commandments of the Lord. It was at the mountain of God where Israel, who was a tribe, a family, large family if you will, but they became from a family to a nation. They turned from a group of 12 tribes to a nation called Israel, a kingdom of priests. But they had to go through the cloud and through the sea to get to the mountain where the law would be given. 
the powers that have shaped their past. Hear me clearly, church family. The powers that had shaped their past and have tormented them in their present through the cloud and through the sea would be destroyed and left behind them. Someone say God's turn. Someone say God's turn. Now this is not to say that he was not already at work. Yes. Yes, many of us know what it's like to try so hard to be in charge. Some of us know what it's like to want so badly to be in control. Only to discover that instead of the situation getting better, it gets worse. And largely, it is due to the fact that we refuse to let go. And like the woman who was sick for 12 long years and spent all that she ha had on everything that she could get only to grow worse, she finally came to the end of herself and said, let's give God a try. Let's give Jesus a turn. Yes, at times we need to wake up and realize that it should be God's turn. It's been my turn long enough. I have managed the game board for long enough. I've allowed myself to be played by people long enough. I've allowed my enemies or even my friends and my family to dictate the direction of my life long enough. And it's time to come around the table and say, it's God's turn. It's God's turn to pick up the piece of my life and place me where he wants me. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. It's God's turn. And someone here today under the sound of my voice or someone that's listening to this recording you have been trying with good intentions from a good heart to do things to better your life, to better your marriage, to better things for your kids. In my experience, in my observation, I have seen people get their marriages and their children into horrible and awful circumstances. But often, if you cut them where they bleed the most, and you look and you can see their heart, it's not because they didn't care or they didn't want something better for their kids, or for their marriage, or even for themselves. It's simply because they didn't know how to let go. They didn't know how to give God a turn. They didn't know how to let God be in charge. And so they continue to put their hand on everything and leave him with nothing. It's God's turn. He's waiting for his turn. But my title today is not simply to remind you that it's time to give God a try. But I want to inform someone today that God will direct us. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place right now. The Lord is here. It's time to remind the Refuge Church as a whole and some of you as individuals that if you will listen if you will obey, if you will walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh, if you will obey the Scriptures, the Bible says in Psalm 37, verse 23, the steps of a good man, they are ordered by the Lord. <laughs> How many here can testify that you, if you're honest with yourself, 
you're sitting here today not because you were savvy enough and wise enough to figure out where you could drink deeply of the waters that were living waters. If you're honest with yourself and you look in the mirror and you speak truth, you can testify that you know what? You didn't arrive here to this place where you could feel the presence of God and hear the word of God and be part of the family of God because you were smart enough to figure out a way to get out of the pit that you were in but it's because God had a turn and you followed after the spirit and you walked after it and you listened to the word of God oh somebody say amen, amen. hallelujah God's turn I'm thankful. I'm so thankful that God doesn't allow me to be born and introduced into this journey and then leave me out to dry, to just fiddle around and figure out how I could get from point A to point B, how I could get from here to heaven and to glory. No, but I find my steps being ordered of the Lord because I put my hands in the hands of my master. He has purposely positioned each step that that I've been taking and I've arrived here it might look bleak and it might look bad but where I am is because the hand of the Lord has been on my life and he has guided me to this very place oh hallelujah hallelujah at times he will lead you to a place where you appear to be stuck between a rock and a hard place hear me now it's not a left turn it's not a left turn, and it's, it's not a right turn. It's not even a U-turn. It's a God turn. There are times where it's right to take a left turn. There are times when it's right to take a left turn. Yeah, yeah, there is. There's times when it's okay to feel like you're left out. There's times when it's okay to feel like you're turned in the direction that doesn't seem right, but it is. There's times when it's okay to turn the direction that nobody else is turning. It's a left turn. And there's times when it's right, it's appropriate to take a right turn. When everybody else seems to be going straight or left, you do what's right. It doesn't matter what the flutters in your chest and the emotions of your heart are trying to convince you of. You do what's right. You do what's right. You keep going right. <laughs> there are others. There are other times. It's not a left turn. It's not a right turn. But sometimes it's an about face. Oh, how many have been there? Sometimes God, he wants you to take a U-turn. Sometimes you don't even have to pray about it, church. You don't even have to meditate on it. You don't even have to ask anybody. You don't even have to make a post on Facebook about it. Sometimes it's just right. You know it's right. Where you take an about face. You don't keep going down the same road you've been going down. Where you take an about face and you start going the exact opposite direction. Because you know it's right. You know according to the word it's right. You know according to the spirit that's that's in you, it's right. I'm talking about a God turn. A God turn. A God turn is inevitable. It's, it's necessary. It's essential. You see, I have found in my life, Brother Parker, left turns and right turns and U-turns. I have found that God can turn them all for my good. Sometimes God will allow me to make the choice, and it's really not an essential. It's not necessary. It's not, it's, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, it, it's a required, but it might be just wisest. And sometimes I don't learn what's wisest immediately, and I learn it from experience. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Am I just babbling here? If I am, don't say yes. There are times when right turns and left turns and U-turns, they're not necessary, they're not essential, but they are just part of what God has allowed you to make up your mind, and He's going to use it for your good, He's going to use it for His glory, and it's not exactly essential, but it's just part of living. But then there are God turns. 
There are God turns. They may not be exactly left or right. They may not be a U-turn. It might not go up or down. But it's a God turn in your life that you could try to avoid it. But if you want to get to the other side of the sea, if you want to try to get to the mountain, you've got to obey the God turn in your life. If, listen, this might not all make sense to everybody, but it's going to make sense to somebody because a God turn in your life, it will feel like this. You come out of Egypt. You come out of that place of bondage. You've been shaken free from the hold that Pharaoh had on you. And you're feeling good, but a God turn will take you to a place that even feels worse. Has anyone ever witnessed, whether it's in your own life or in someone you know, you have witnessed when they try to do good, that evil is present with them? When someone shows up to the church, it took you pulling teeth and a nail to, to get them to finally show up to church and they come. They feel the presence of God. Emotions are high and, and it seems like resolution is thick, but they walk out the door and somewhere between Sunday and Thursday and not even Thursday, sometimes just between Sunday and Monday, it seems like the adversary has relocated them and is tracking them down. What happened to them? There's an essential. There's an essential turn. It's a God turn. It's a place where you've got to go through the sea and you've got to go through the cloud. You've got to be born through the womb of the sea and the cloud because you're going to come out the other side to the mountain of God and you can't get there any other way. This was an example for us all to see. This was a demonstration for us all to follow these so that the Egyptians may know that the Lord, He is God. Oh, some of you have already figured it out. One of the first God turns that you ever had in your life was when you may have come to an apostolic Holy Ghost filled church, but you realize it's not enough to feel the goosebumps. It's not enough to shed a few tears. But you've got to go through the cloud and the sea. Come on, somebody help me preach right now. You know what it's like to feel that emotion that swells in your soul. And you know what it's like to be around people that seem to love you just as you are. But it's not enough just to be a part of a new social club. You've got to have a spiritual new birth. You've got to get some DNA in you that wasn't there before. You've got to have a blood transfusion. You've got to have a new heart because the old one was bad. Somebody shout yes. yes. What I'm talking about is while in the Old Testament they were baptized by the cloud and the sea, we are baptized by the Spirit and the water. We've got to be born again of water and the Spirit because there's no other way to get the law in our hearts and arrive to the mountain where God will speak. God wants to speak to you and God wants to make you a priest in his kingdom. But you've got to go through the cloud and the sea. Let us not forget who we are. We are the children of God by the adoption of the Spirit whereby we could cry, Abba, Father. We didn't get there because we were good enough. We didn't get there because we had the right pedigree. We didn't get there because we learned how to dress right or talk right. We got there because we were baptized in the name of Jesus and filled with the Spirit of the living God. That's how we come. Oh, let's lift our hands right now in this place. We worship you, Lord. We need you, oh, Lord Jesus. Have your way in this place. Oh, thank you, Lord. Pray with me for a little while, church. Would you just pray with me? Talk to the Lord about what you've heard from God. Lord, we love you. We need you right now, Jesus. We need you right now. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. 
I wonder if for about 60 seconds longer, could we just entertain the presence of the Lord and begin to respond to the Word of God? I feel like there's wanting to be a demonstration in this place of the supernatural, of the miraculous deliverance of Jesus Christ that's possible in this place. That's it, church. We love you, Lord. Lift up your voices for about 30 more seconds. Just begin to worship Him. Respond to Him. If you've already been born again, begin to thank Him right now. Yes. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Someone say, thank you, Jesus. If you could, just listen for just a few moments. I'm thankful that when things get difficult, the water rises and the floods fall. When it seems like I'm surrounded on every side, I'm thankful I could go back to when he carried me through the sea. You see, the Israelites, they were in this difficult place. The sea before them, the mountains on either side, Pharaoh's army coming up from behind. And they felt like they're, they were there in an impossible situation. There was no way out. They begin to second guess their decision to leave Egypt in the first place and be, begin to even complain and say, it would have been better for us if you would have just left us in Egypt than to die in the wilderness. You see, they had tasted freedom, but were convinced when times got difficult very quickly that it would have been better to be in bondage than free in the wilderness. But the Lord had directed them exactly where he wanted them because it won't be enough. Listen, it won't be enough just to break free for a little while only to return to that pit, only to have the enemy come back again. But you've got to have the baptism of the sea and the cloud. Let me tell you why. Because when they came through the sea and God caused the waters to stand up like walls on either side of them. Could you imagine? Imagine this wall over here and this wall over here being walls of water held by the hand of God. And for us as a people to walk through what had been soaked with water, now dry, walking through to the other side. Oh, what a miraculous moment. And then to see that Egypt, that Pharaoh, that his army was coming up and taking the same passageway, it followed them into the walled water passageway. It followed them into the water. But when they got onto the other side, they watched as God performed deliverance. The Bible says that the wheels of the chariots begin to fall off. Things begin to fall apart. The strength of Pharaoh began to, to wane. And the Egyptians said, God is fighting for them. And they found themselves in between two walls of water. Chariot wheels falling off their chariots. And them there in that place. And the Israelites looking at them and Moses lifted up his rod and the walls of water came crashing down and the Lord said the enemy that you see today you'll never see again those people that have hounded you and abused you that past that has haunted you for 430 years is not going to follow you one more day 
Why? Because they came through the water. They came through the water. I'm so thankful that I came through the water. When we baptize someone, their sin may follow them down into that watery grave, but it ain't coming up when they come up out of the water. That sin, that past, that shame may follow them down into the water, but when they come up, it ain't coming up on the other side. Why? Because they came through the water. Somebody say amen. You see, Jesus, through his death, burial, and resurrection, he has spoiled principalities and powers. According to Colossians 2.15, he has made an open show of it all, triumphing over it. But listen, there's an element. There's a God turn that every soul must take. Listen, it's available. It's available. The riches are available. The beauty is available. But you've got to take that God turn through the sea and the cloud. Would you stand to your feet with me right now? Oh, Lord, we love you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I know of one that is here today among us, and perhaps there's others that have come today with their mind made up that they need to be baptized in the name of Jesus. I could say for myself, I'm so thankful that I was baptized in that saving name. For there is only one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, and that is the name of Jesus. It's that same name that every knee shall bow to and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There is power in the name. There is power in that name. Somebody say that name right now. Jesus. Jesus. I'm not encouraging you to do it right now. But if you would look around the church family, it's called the refuge here today. You'll find that there are a few common denominators here. We've got different shades of skin. There's even different languages that are being spoken here. We eat different foods. We live in different places. I've told some general contractors that we've been talking to and they've asked about our congregation and I've told them we've got people that live from Muscatine to Eldridge to Bettendorf to Orion to Geneseo to all in the Quad Cities. We've got folks that are older, younger, and everywhere in between. We've got single adults and young families. We've got retirees. We've, listen, we're all over the place. And you've got to ask what brings you together? What makes you a family? A family shares something. What are you sharing? We all took that God turn. We all decided we needed to be born again. We are on that way. We are on that path. And we are allowing the Word of God to direct our lives. If you have not yet repented of your sins... And you need to allow God to have a turn in your life. Today is a good day to ha have that happen. With every eye closed, nobody looking around. If you're here today, even if you've been born again years ago, but you're at a place, you're at a crossroad in your life. Where you've been making the choices, you've been making and deciding which way you're going to go. And God has given you grace. But you know what? It's time to stop avoiding the essential turn in your life. God wants you to face some things here today. For some of you, it's to pursue being born again of water and the Spirit. It's to repent of your sins, to be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins, and to seek to be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's a gift. It's a glorious gift. And you will know when you're filled with His Spirit because you will begin to speak as His Spirit gives you the utterance, a language you've never learned before, you haven't been taught. But it is a supernatural event that is universal, that demonstrates and displays that you have been filled with the Spirit. As we lift our hands right now, who here among us, it's time to take a God turn. God's turn is waiting in your life. God's turn is waiting for you to obey. Sure, it looks like 
It's going to end in disaster. It's going to end in destruction. But God is looking to place you in this impossible situation so that he could demonstrate for all to see that he is the Lord and that there is none other beside him. Refuge Church, I kind of feel like this message is broadly speaking to us as a church family that you know what? God is setting us up in an impossible situation because He wants to show to all that He is the Lord God and that there is no other beside Him. That He is the one that is ordering our steps and there is no other beside Him. As they begin to play and begin to sing, I want us to begin to make our personal areas an altar. We're not yet going to open up the front area for people to come and pray in mass. But I wonder if right where you're standing, you could choose to remain standing or kneel at your seat or you could sit down. But I want you to respond to what God has spoken to you about today. Now let's begin to lift our voices as they begin to sing. And you begin to respond. Go ahead. Begin to talk to the Lord. If you need to repent of your sins, why don't you go ahead and do that, Lord? I'm sorry for the things that I have done. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for poor choices that I have made. Lord, I'm wanting you to take it and work it for good. I'm asking you to make make my mess into a miracle. Have your way in my life. I love you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. That's it, church. Go ahead. As they sing, let's begin to lift up our voices. Let's begin to talk to the Lord and respond to the presence of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is the will of God that we have an altar call in this place today. It is the will of God that someone seek the face of the Lord. That someone even be filled with the Spirit of God. Let's facilitate that. Right where we're at. Right where we're positioned. Let's facilitate a move of God. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. We love you, Lord God. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Let's take our time. Let's take our time.